2021, Amy, if you could flip, thank you. 2021 marks the 11th year of the TLT Faculty Fellows Program. Annually, faculty from across the Commonwealth are invited to submit fellowship proposals. Over the years, themes have included digital badges, blogs, data-empowered learning, immersive technologies, gaming and play, data visualization and quantification, cross-cultural communication, MOOCs, and making. The theme for the 2019-20 year was learning spaces. We awarded four fellowships, each representing a novel perspective on learning spaces. This morning, each of our panelists will give a quick 12-minute talk on their project. Feel free to share your questions in the Q&A section. We'll address those either as they arise between panelists or capture your questions and follow up after today's event. It's my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Priya Sharma, Associate Professor of Education in the Learning Design and Technology Program, who will share with you how she's developing a design framework that reflects the more encompassing conceptualization of learning spaces as learning places. Priya. Thank you, Crystal. And I'd like to, if you could just go back to the last page for a second, thank you. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank everybody at TLT for giving me this space and opportunity to explore these ideas. Um, I see a lot of um, match to what uh, Laurie just mentioned, and I hope to uh, bring some of that out. Um, it's also a pleasure and an honor to be the first speaker. And I was sort of wondering why, but um, I think one way that I see this all wrapping together is uh, the approach that I'm taking is, is very conceptual. And so I think what Laurie presented is, is a good segue to talking about how I'm conceptualizing um, this notion of spaces and places. So if we could move to the next slide, um, I can talk a little bit more about how this project started. Um, some of this work uh, came about from a collaboration with uh, faculty uh, collaborators at, um, in architecture. And one of the things that was interesting to me was how architects and designers both use design in very different ways. When architects talk about design, they not only talk about the construction um, and the design of a place, but then also they look at how do people engage, um, sort of how do they interact with the space in the way that makes the space you know, a welcoming um, kind of place. And I've put here two kind of images uh, that come from Penn State. The first is uh, Thomas 100 or 110. Um, and the second one is the one that Laurie just shared uh, of the uh, ESI 110. And as you can see, both of them are designed and arranged very differently. Um, and so one of the things that we can think about as designers is, is to say, when people go into these spaces, how do they interact, right? What kinds of things do they do in these uh, spaces? And how does the arrangement of things uh, in that location shape what people are doing? Um, and I think this quote here by Winston Churchill actually is a great summation of where I am in my thinking and where I'm hoping this project will take um, us all forward in thinking about uh, what we're doing. So the idea is that we shape our buildings, but thereafter they shape us. And this, I think, is something that maybe designers spend less time thinking about. And by designers, I mean instructional designers, learning designers. Um, I think very often our focus is on thinking about how do we design content? How do we design interactions between you know, students and the content and the instructor? Uh, but I think sometimes we're less attentive to the holistic effect of the space that we're in and how that might influence the kinds of behaviors um, or the learning engagements that we're trying to, uh, to promote. So if we could move to the next slide, um, I think two concepts that have been really important um, in helping me to think about this um, and maybe uh, will help us all to problematize what we're looking at, is this notion of space and place. Um, I'll give you a quick sort of summary of where I am in this thinking, and I'd welcome your thoughts and ideas about how this could be moving forward. Um, in reading a lot of architectural um, and sort of human geography books, the way that space is described is very much as a location, right? So the coordinates of a, of a, of a place um, I'm sorry, of a space. And it can also refer to arrangements of things. So for example, in this room, um, we see how chairs are arranged. We see where the monitor is. Uh, we look at the position of the windows. So space is very much talking about physical um, arrangements of things, especially locations and positions. But then if we move to the second next slide, uh, we look at place, which is the way that people 
use that space, right? So you might arrange a chair in a certain way and a table in a certain way, but a user or a, a inhabitant might go in and pull the chair out and move the table around, um, which brings us to the point that even though we design the space, the way that the users or the inhabitants use them makes it very much a personal sort of, um, you know, ownership uh, kind of place related aspect. And um, so that I think is the dichotomy. And I'm not saying that they're separate. I think you have to consider space and place. If you don't have a good arrangement and if you don't have a good physical um, space, it's hard to think about how that could become a place. So I think as designers, architects, I think are already doing this to some extent, but I think as designers, we can learn a little bit more about how do we combine these two concepts to uh, make uh, something really um, integral to the kind of goal that we want to achieve. So if we move to the next slide, uh, the first step in sort of us thinking about how you could design for place was to understand how place was being described and designed in the literature. And this was actually really a fascinating um, experience for me. And again, I'm, I'm really thankful that TLT offered me the chance to do this. Uh, we read a really wide variety of um, references from all over, from many, many disciplines. Um, so architecture, environmental psychology, human geography, interior design. And uh, one of the main questions we had is, uh, if there is a design for place, what does that look like? And what was interesting is that we, we found a lot of uh, research that talked about place, but very often it's, it's used or conflated in the same way as space. Um, and there wasn't actually much about design, but what they did talk a lot about uh, was how do you conceptualize what place means? And what we identified in the literature is that places are uh, considered as centers of meaning. So people consider a place to be something that has a very deep uh, meaning to it. Um, it's very much linked to lived experiences. So you can only create a place when you've had time um, and engagements in that place over, over a period of time. And it's also linked to identity. That means in some sense, it makes a difference to how you perceive yourself or how you think about your actions in relation to the world. And the last um, part that was interesting is this notion that places are defined by a subjective and emotional attachment to a location. This is sort of interesting for us as, uh, could we go back to the last slide, please? Thank you. Um, this is sort of interesting because when we talk about classrooms, we're talking about very transient places. So we're talking about uh, places where people come in for 50 minutes, maybe three hours at a time, and then they leave. So how do we actually talk about this notion of place um, in something that's like a classroom? So our next step, uh, which we are describing in the next slide, is how do we um, start to develop these indicators of place? Um, so our goal was, which um, has been halted by COVID as many of our projects have been, but hopefully we uh, plan to continue and do this once we are able to access the spaces and have permission to do in-person research again. Um, our goal was to examine um, a number of instructor-student interactions within Althaus 101 and AXI 110 because both of these, as Laurie mentioned, are newly redesigned spaces. Um, and so we wanted to use a combination of surveys, um, interviews, and observations to understand how are people using the, the space in a way that makes it a place. And again, we have very um, sort of, I would say, conceptual categories that we want to use to look at that. So if we move to the next slide, I'll talk very briefly about the kinds of things that we'd be looking for as we collected this data. So for example, some of the things that uh, we want to look at, and I'm just going to make a, make a quick um, run through of these, is in creating a place, what do people do in the setting to make it a place? So for example, are there ways that they're personalizing the room? Is the instructor doing specific things? Is the instructor arranging chairs or asking students to group themselves in specific ways that's making this space a place? Um, a second idea is what is this notion of place memory, right? For example, what are the kinds of things from the past that come back in the space and make uh, the production and reproduction of social memory more possible? So for example, um, I don't know if any of you have had the chance to go to the library's um, space, the newly re redesigned spaces. You know, they have whiteboards and sometimes if you walk in, you see um, writing from groups in the past that just stays on there. And that is a, a form of place memory. And so there might be other ways that uh, classrooms such as AXA and um, the Blue Box can use place memory to kind of enhance this feeling of connection 
um, and being in a place rather than just being in a space. Uh, we're also looking at identity performance. Are there specific ways in which student and faculty identity is being performed in a place differently um, in, a, in a, you know, redesigned classroom versus another classroom? Um, I think another thing that we're interested in looking at is how we can look at the same event through multiple perspectives and how that might give us a sense of how is this becoming a place for different people. Um, the last two are uh, thinking about how are people spatially oriented in the space, right? So when they walk in, what are the kinds that they automatically do? Uh, how does that help us to think about this learning um, space as a place? And ultimately, the goal, I think, is to try to um, understand how we um, as designers uh, and, uh, you know, educators and um, everything, all the different sort of disciplines that are, in, you know, involved in doing this, how can we think about using both space and place conceptually um, and um, practically in thinking about designing uh, learning in face-to-face -face and virtual settings. Um, so I think that's probably a very, uh, <laughs> very uh, quick but in-depth sort of run through of where we are. Um, I'll, I think I'm, I can stop here and I have, um, I can hand it over to the next person. Yeah, we have, uh, we have time for a few questions, if anyone has any. Um, I have one, but I always have questions. So I'll see if there's anyone in the audience today who uh, would like to post any questions to the chat and give you an opportunity to attend to any that are there. Otherwise, um, I have a question for you. Let's start with you, Crystal. You can ask me the easy question, right? <laughs> well, mainly, yeah. So I, I just, I think this notion of place is so incredibly important. And I, I'm struck as you're talking about how many conversations I'm in right now with people who are thinking about how to make a variety of learning places for students this fall. And, um, you know, you may be thinking about this yourself, Priya. So I'm just curious, do you see as you kind of go down through these categories, are, do the categories apply to online learning places? Do they apply to remote learning places, uh, mixed mode learning places? Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, Crystal. And I, I think uh, the specific time that we're in really um, contributes um, some urgency to thinking about this. Um, so yeah, the short answer is yes. I think all of these ideas um, have, I, I think can have a significant impact on how we think about designing um, these different uh, places, whether it's online, whether it's mixed mode or hybrid. Um, I think what's important is to sort of start gathering data that helps us to address these different um, indicators of places and sort of how we can develop that and make that a better experience for uh, both students and instructors. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Uh, thank you so much. So if folks have questions, feel free to put those into the, the Q&A window and we'll be sure to uh, address those as time goes along or after the presentation today. Um, so. Priya, the, the notion of learning places is so critical, especially as we think about our next panelist, Pierre Salguero, Associate Professor of Asian History and Religious Studies at Penn State Abington. So through expansion of his Jivika project, Pierce is leveraging virtual learning field trips to capitalize on the learning spaces or places that communities provide. Pierce? All right, thank you, thank you Crystal. Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, as Crystal just said, my, um, my project is very much focused on um, interpreting TLT's theme of um, learning spaces uh, as uh, how do we extend beyond the classroom into the community uh, and into the, the broader world beyond. Um, so I'm from the Abington campus, and for those of you who don't know us, uh, we are the most um, diverse campus at Penn State. We're located right outside of Philadelphia. Um, we have a lot of students who are from the um, Asian communities within Philly and also a lot of international students from Asia. And so one of the things I was I have been thinking about for many years is how to um, how, how to tap into the uh, student expertise and the student um, uh, the students themselves having familiarity with Asian religions and Asian culture in my classes. And so um, several years ago, about, about five years ago, I started a project called the Jivaka Project. Um, and Amy, if you can, yeah, there we go. If you can pull that up for me. Um, the uh, Jivaka Project uh, is a student-based um, 
story it started as a storytelling ethnography project where students went out into the buddhist temples around um, philadelphia and brought back um, stories from their from the communities about how buddhism and healthcare um, interlink and um, there are many different ways that buddhist temples are involved in the uh, in healthcare health and healing um, all around um, the the city and these are some of the themes to explore that amy's showing you right now on the website um, and so this project was, uh, um, it, like I said, it started with a storytelling ethnography. Um, it developed through support from uh, Schreier as well from, from Abington um, into a documentary film collaboration with a documentary filmmaker from Columbia University. Um, and she and I shot a number of uh, films in the, in the temples that are related to these themes. Um, you can see here at, at the... Um, the, the main page of the project, a trailer film that we made just introducing the project on the whole. Um, we're not gonna play it, I'll just have, just, uh, have the um, URL in the uh, chat for you and you can, you can check it out. It's uh, jivaka.net. Um, in any event, uh, the, the, the proposal that I made to TLT was to uh, expand, after five years of running this project in Philadelphia, I wanted to expand it to a more international focus and uh, the plan was for the uh, for the international uh, phase of the Jivika project to involve uh, three uh, 360 uh, filming as well as um, more in-depth uh, cultural ethnography uh, in Buddhist temples in Japan um, so that whole project got put on pause due to COVID as many people's projects have been um, I'm thinking right now, wow, it would have been great if uh, I had all of this 360 footage from Japan um, while we were teaching virtually. It would have been uh, an amazing experience to be able to share that with my students. Um, but uh, the, the trip to Japan was, um, was, was unfortunately put on hold. It was meant to happen this summer. Uh, meanwhile, um, Amy, I don't know if you can go back to the other slide to Jivika um, and just kind of like show that meanwhile on, on Jivika uh, with a couple of colleagues of mine, we have um, uh, started another area of um, the website, which is Buddhism in the pandemic. And there we are um, gathering reports from around the world. I have lots of colleagues in Asia who are um, sending in um, uh, reports around um, what 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 is happening globally within Buddhist temples, how they're responding to the healthcare crisis. Um, so we've we've done the best we can remotely, and I'm looking forward to getting to Japan hopefully next summer and uh, and and fulfilling the uh, the original plan, uh, which um, Amy can show you the the wonderful uh, equipment that's sitting in my in my office right now with uh, with nothing to do. Um, but uh, TLT was was. Um, uh, very generous in their support of equipment. So there's uh, 360 camera um, and, and a lot of other gear that goes with it, um, tripods and batteries and hard drives and so forth. Um, critically, uh, I, I am a specialist in Buddhism, but my, specialis my specialization is in Chinese uh, language, not Japanese. And so um, TLT also um, uh, assisted in funding a on-site research assistant and translator for me, who's a colleague of mine, um, he's a professor at a, at a um, university in Tokyo who uh, did a lot of the groundwork um, already uh, by identifying locations um, where it would be good to do the filming and um, making contact with individuals uh, in charge of the different temples and um, getting sort of everything ready and scheduled. Um, that's where we were when the, when the trip was canceled. Uh, TLT also also provided some travel funds for the um, for my my side of the trip as well. Um, so, like I said, I'm hoping a, or the plan is for all of that to take place um, next summer and for the um, materials to be up online um, on the Jivika website. Um, what what we're hoping to do is about a, uh, at least ten different um, uh, temples in various parts of. of Tokyo and Kyoto and the surrounding area. Uh, we are hoping to have a, um, uh, a virtual tour where students would be able to uh, both see um, video and still footage of uh, various parts of the temple, but then also be able to drop into a virtual tour through um, uh, through either VR goggles or through um, 
the Google tour uh, website. So as luck would have it, um, just before uh, um, being shut down for due to COVID, um, I was in Chinatown um, just practicing, sort of figuring out how to use this 360 camera. Uh, and I went to the uh, Foshou Temple in, um, in, in downtown Chinatown. It's a very small temple. It's a one room temple. Um, and I, I just practiced sort of setting up my, my camera there and um, getting a feel for what this would look like in Japan. Um, I was planning on doing a lot more temples in Philadelphia um, that, you know, to, to be able to practice using the, the equipment before going abroad. Um, but this, uh, unfortunately, is the only one that I was able to do. Um, but Amy can show you, this is a, this is Google Tour. Um, it's a three, 360 uh, photo that has been put into Google Tour. So uh, it's, you know, accessible freely online and you can scroll around. Um, you can then click on any one of the icons um, that are that are floating around there, and you and you zoom in. Uh, and then I've I've written some brief descriptions. Um, in eventually, this would be integrated into um, the Jivika website, where we have a lot of information about these individual temples. We have audio recordings, video recordings, and all sorts of um, uh, write, written information as well. Um, the Jivika website also has a uh, interactive um, map. All of these uh, locations are mapped out um, in, in Philadelphia, uh, and you can sort that map, um, you know, by different categories and different keywords. Uh, and I should have said at the beginning, there's about 50 Buddhist temples um, the, in, in the database right now um, around Philadelphia. There's, uh, oh. If I could interrupt you just a yep. second, there is a question specifically about sort of access I, to these kinds of temples, and I was just curious if you'd mind addressing it. Yeah, uh, it seems like now could be a good time. Did you yeah, see I saw it? that pop up. Yeah, you did. Was, okay. Yeah, I was just gonna get. I was just gonna mention that. Um, uh, so, the question is about cameras being allowed in the in the temples, and um, uh, obviously, if t if cameras aren't allowed in a temple, we we won't be taking photos there. Um, and th this is something that we have run into in Philadelphia, uh, in the Philadelphia area in uh, one out of 50 of the temples. Um, the, the rest of the temples have been very, um, very willing to participate in the project. Um, the, when, when I was talking about um, uh, storytelling ethnography at the beginning of my presentation, um, one, of the, one of the things that um, I feel very committed to as an ethnographer uh, is in having the communities that we are interacting with be the ones who are telling the, their stories. Um, and we are there, um, the ethnographers, the students are there to uh, record the stories that the temples want to tell us. So of course, if they, if they don't want to give us access to the temple, um, if they don't want to ask certain questions, if, we're, if they don't want to have photos of certain things be put up on our website, we're very happy to accommodate that. Um, but like I was saying, the um, the students themselves really are are members. In many cases, the students who who have done um, who have participated in this project are themselves members of these communities. Their parents are members of the temple, or their grandparents are members of the temple. Um, and they speak the languages, and a, you know a lot of this ethnography is being done in 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 Lao or Khmer or Chinese or or what have you. Um, and so the students have. Um, you know, a kind of a kind of access uh, and cultural um, facility um, with these communities that that there's there's no way that um, that I would ever be able to have, um, and so the relationship that we have with the temples is is um, not really about me collecting data there. It's about the students bringing forth stories from their communities into this into this project. Um, the dynamic in Japan is 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 different. Um, the dynamic in Japan because um, we're not using members of the temples themselves. I'm, you know, I'm using a, a, um, a research assistant who's a professor um, himself and a scholar. Uh, the dynamic there is, is a little bit different. Um, and my, my colleague in Japan has, has really, um, one, his major, uh, his main task, I mean, other than identifying the locations and you know, doing some translation while we're there, his, the real challenge for him is, um, is establishing the relationships um, with the temples so that we we can have access. Um, and again, we'll be we'll be following the same kind of general policy there of only only um, only willing participants participants who are excited to participate in the project um, 
are the, those are the only kinds of participants that we're um, going to be working with. Um, so uh, I, I just, yeah, I wanted to finish up just by really thanking Crystal, um, who was super helpful in um, putting together the proposal and all of that. And then also um, shout out to Amy Kuntz, who's uh, kind of done a lot of the heavy lifting with the helping me with the equipment, teach me how to use it and so forth. But the, the whole TLT team, you, you, all, you all have been great and really supportive in this uh, strange, bizarre um, uh, uh, project here, getting put on hold and everything like that, and sorting out all the details. So thank you to all of you. Here's uh, Ms. Crystal. So uh, to me, one of the exciting things about the Jivica project is the teaching resources you've developed to go along with it. Would you take just a minute and maybe talk a little bit about what's there on the Jivica website and what it really takes from a curricular perspective to leverage a resource like this? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so so um, the the Jivica website is is itself a pedagogical resource. That's how it's framed. Um, the whole project is designed to be able to. Um, I I mean I should say this is this is the only. Um, comprehensive ethnography of Buddhism in any uh, any city in the world, as far as I know. Um, there isn't another uh, example. And Philadelphia is really interesting, interestingly um, diverse and unique in the sense that it, it has um, representatives of pretty much every kind of Buddhism you can think of. Um, and it's small enough that it's we can be comprehensive. It's not like trying to do this in New York or LA. Um, so uh, these 50 temples, you know, give a great sort of snapshot of um, Buddhism globally. Uh, and so my idea with the website was to um, gather um, the, the, the data, the photos, the audio recordings, video recordings, virtual tours, all together to make it possible for uh, myself, but also for colleagues uh, around the world, around the country, to be able to do virtual tours um, and virtual ethnography with their students, especially if they live in places where, you know, they're teaching about Buddhism, but it's really textbook based learning because there aren't um, Buddhist communities. So um, the whole website is geared towards uh, pedagogy. And there's not only the, the data and the media, but there's also um, a lot of uh, the, the um, bibliographies and teaching tools and, and all of the material is, uh, is um, put up there with a Creative Commons license. So it, I'm encouraging my colleagues to reuse and adapt. Um, and I, I can say that we have, um, I have a few colleagues that are running sort of mini Jivika projects in Honolulu and in um, other parts of the US. Um, so I think I'm running out of time. Uh, uh, I see that Rangun has a question about Indian temples and I'll, I'll address that in the Q&A. And if anybody else has any questions, just drop them in there and I'll be happy to follow up with you over in the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you, Pierce. Thank you so much. Uh, virtual field trips are something that we're seeing more and more of all the time. And so uh, it's been really exciting to see how this aspect of the Jivika project just continues to develop. So our um, next panelist is Pansy Lun. She is assistant teaching professor and director of undergraduate laboratories in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Pansy is using mixed reality to reimagine laboratory learning spaces in engineering. Pansy. Thanks, Christo. So in this project, we will talk about how we use virtual reality for laboratory teaching. So the project idea is we want to transform a real world laboratory experiment to a virtual platform. So as you can see on the left hand side, it's a physical setup in our ME control lab. So um, just briefly talk about the system. Uh, it is a simplified setup. You can imagine it's a mass spring damper system. So the golden part is a mass that student can put on and then it is linked by the silver spring. When we run the experiment, the student can manipulate the setup by pushing the mask left and right or having the motor. The motor is the one like a wheel on the left hand side to move the system. So um, we want the first step in this project is we want to transform this experimental setup to a virtual platform. As you can see, we put I put some example on the right hand side. Um, this is not our final product. It just demonstrates the concept. So to transfer to virtual platform, there are different type of technology that we can use right now. 
and are there different terms that you may have heard about virtual reality, VR, main reality, AR, mixed reality, MR, and or even the term XR, extended reality. So let's just briefly go over all these terms. So the XR extended reality acts as the umbrella term encapsulating all the VR, AR, and MR. So for VR, virtual reality on the left-hand side, you're really transferring yourself or immerse yourself into a new environment. So really trust me. So after you put on the headset, go for your adventure, even though if you're doing it at your home, you probably will forget where you are after you put put uh, put your headset down. So you're really immersed to a new environment. So uh, another technology is augmented reality, AR, a really good example. Um, maybe some of you have used that app is the Pokemon Go. As you can see, you're still in a real world environment with some virtual objects. So that is AR. And then um, the term mixed reality, MR, actually it can be uh, fully immersive in a virtual environment or you can use the real environment as the background. But the power is that it allows you to interact with different objects with your real hand. So which means that um, it is a, uh, the idea is that you can put on the headset, you can uh, immerse yourself in the, another environment, but at the same time, I can grab a, um, a cup on top of my table, drink it, and then maybe you grab a virtual ball, flow it, there's a virtual dog, go grab a box to you. you. You can have the power of the, all those interactions is the idea of the um, mixed reality. So really specific to our project. So there are some pros and cons with different technology. The pros for VR is uh, it is immersive. You, we can bring students to another environment. We can make impossible possible. For example, we can bring students to outer space. We can bring students to a power plant safely. So, but the downside is that it requires specific equipment. So, which uh, usually is the VR headset. As for AR, the uh, the pros is that it can access even through your cell phone. There, there are options that you can use the AR goggle, but um, most of the apps that you've seen right now, you can use your cell phone to access it. Um, to our project, because we want to transfer a engineering lab online, so sometime uh, the background using the real world may not be a good option for us. And another downside is the interaction is really limited. For you can imagine you, if you're accessing it using your cell phone, which is simply some drag or zoom in, zoom out. So I would say this technology would be good if you just want to demonstrate a experiment equipment or the process. There are actually some apps that is available right now can do these purpose. So lastly, for uh, mixed reality, I would say it is really everything we want. But in terms of development, the technology is not mature enough. So after analyzing all these pros and cons, what we end up with is we choose to use the VR headset with a uh, haptic controller. So the haptic controller will allow you to interact with the virtual objects, which means that if you remember our experimental setup, the student need to move the weights left and right. With the haptic controller, the student is able to do that. So, and, um, in this slide, I also want to uh, thank Zach. Zach is the lead creative for XR in TLT. He, he is the person who bring this whole project to life. And he also gave me lots of good suggestions throughout the process in designing the content. So why we want to do this project? What is the project uh, initiative? First of all, is um, definitely is reduced physical space requirement. So after we put on the headset, we do need some space to use your equipment, to use your VR headsets. But the benefit is um, within that space, we can shuffle hundreds, thousands of experiments around. So um, another benefit for using virtual lab is support remote learning. I think uh, probably most of us can think about it right now with the COVID situation. So, but to 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 me and for us for um chemical engineering department, the reason for this project is we want to reinforce fundamental concept and prepare students to hands-on activity. What does that mean? Is because uh, 
Our department is on, have an ongoing renovation project to replace our theory driven experiment to problem based. So which means that we'll have students go to the lab and then apply the theory they learn to solve a real world challenge in class. So the, um, we all know the space is limited. We cannot put all the um, equipment in, in the lab space. However, we cannot have students jump to the next step of problem solving without reinforcing the concept. So therefore, we propose to use the virtual lab for those purposes. So, and then um, last but not the least is um, for the initiative for this project is get prepared for the next generation. I actually like put this little boy in here on purpose because when uh, I visit elementary school, even elementary students right now in their science lab, they put on the VR goggle and do different kinds of things. So in order to make us compatible to the next generation, we really need to start thinking about using this technology in teaching. So um, after I talk about the project idea, I want to show everyone the, a video to demonstrate uh, our virtual lab, the product from this project. Here's a short video to walk you through our lab. So our, there is several key elements I want to highlight in the virtual lab. So it will show you the power of a VR lab and also something uh, to consider if you want to build a VR lab. First of all is the VR lab actually gives us a benefit to track student progress. We can have personal login for every single student and know what data they collect, where they are. And then um, we can use the virtual lab to help students understand the experimental setup, as you can see, um, in our virtual lab, we ask students collect different parts for the experimental setup and build it because the, uh, one of the benefit in virtual lab is it really saves time. So if I want students to build a whole setup in a real scenario, it may take hours. In virtual platform, it may just take a couple minutes and they can really understand the function of every single part. So um, we will require the virtual lab to perform very similarly to real experiments, so how it manipulates. So and another thing you may want to consider if you want to build a VR lab is we need to have the data visualization and also data analyze system built in. The reason is students put on their headset, it's just really hard for them to put it down and then go to the computer, process the data, and then put it back on to do their experiment. So the last part is really show some, make some like impossible possible we can really demonstrate their real world device response in our, in our virtual lab because the experiment that we have is a mass spring damper system, which is very similar to a cast suspension. So after the student decide the control and how they want the dynamic response act like in the system, they can deploy it to a 
virtual car and see how it reacts in, the, in, in a car situation. So for the next step of our project, we want to study how an immersive environment can enhance student engagement. And then we want to compare their student learning effectiveness in a physical lab, in a real world lab, a web-based lab, and also a, the XR lab that we built. For the web-based lab, actually, is something new that we recently created to adapt for the COVID situation. Because um, as you can imagine, if we want to use this um, lab next semester, I cannot have every single system have the VR setup in their at their home. So therefore, we build that web-based lab. And to me, I think it is a really valuable piece because right now we really can compare if the student are immersed putting the VR goggle immersed into their lab environment versus they just do it on the desktop. So lastly, one thing we want to study is how the virtual lab can enhance student uh, problem-solving skills. And, and that's it for the presentation. And in the, uh, thank you, Pansy, so much. In, in the interest of time, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presenter. Uh, if you have questions for Pansy, please go ahead and put them into the Q&A window. I'm sure she'll be very happy to address them there. Uh, our final panelist, last but certainly not least, is Ed Glantz, teaching professor in the College of IST. Ed is personalizing learning spaces by streaming and recording lectures. And um, streaming and recording lectures is something that is seeing a tremendous uptick in interest right now, as you might imagine, and are probably experiencing yourself on some level. So Ed, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Crystal. I'd like to begin by thanking the TLT team. They've been very helpful, Bart, Crystal, and, and in particular, Hannah Williams, who was just a wonderful project manager to help me get through this year, which got very exciting towards the end. I began streaming and recording my face-to-face -face sections over a year ago, so well before the coronavirus outbreak, to supplement learning places and spaces. I teach large sections, and I was never comfortable telling a student missing class for a job interview, illness, injury, family emergency, and so on, to just get notes from a friend. So on the next slide, I'll talk about a few uh, changes that have taken place to make this possible. So I took advantage, it seems like good things always come in threes and that's no difference here. I took advantage of recording in conjunction with Penn State's implementation first of Zoom for video conferencing, second of Kaltura as a video platform, and third, the integration of these products into Canvas, our course management system. First, I created a separate Zoom meeting ID for each class. Then I wore a mic into class to record the class meetings using Zoom. Then I shared the recordings with students by adding either the Kaltura or Zoom navigation features from the Canvas settings. Kaltura has a bit of video, a bit of overhead, but it also provides detailed viewership data. Zoom is very lightweight, but it only shares the media um, and there's no viewership information. So I would recommend that you experiment with one or the other or perhaps even both. So next, let's look at some reasons you might want to consider course recordings. Uh, to avoid limiting the scope unnecessarily, rather than uh, thinking of this as course lecture cap capture, consider using the phrase supplemental recordings of class content. In addition to engaging the absent students I previously referenced, other reasons to consider supplemental recordings include helping English as second language students and other students wishing to further review course content, engaging students more intimately during the session by lowering the need for intense note taking, maintaining quarantine isolation and social distancing requirements. And yes, these were on the list prior to the coronavirus outbreak. I, I felt uh, fortunately that uh, last spring, my classes transitioned very smoothly and elegantly to, to completely being online as a result. I added to these benefits on the right column, uh, the experience as we were teaching remote synchronous following spring break. Um, so I hadn't thought of these before that, but there were clearly with students uh, now, now extended around the world expected to attend uh, synchronous sessions. There were time zone issues that complicated that and there was also occasional technical complications. So this is another reason to supplement the live session with the recording of it for the class. 
Um, there's also some future benefits, which we started to explore, and that's the application of machine learning and data science features, such as national, natural language processing to improve navigation of the, uh, of the recordings, as well as some other benefits, such as teaching feedback. And TLT is actually working on that already in a project called Spectrum. So let's look at the next slide where I'll review my impressions or lessons learned for faculty considering supplemental recordings. <clears throat> First, uh, we always overlook this, but it should not be obvious. Students do not expect supplemental recordings, so you do have to promote and create awareness that the feature is available. So this is in addition to including the availability in the email response to absence notifications. I found this opportunity to include that in those email particularly gratifying. Uh, second, it is positive to note that engaged students are the ones that are most likely to take advantage of the recordings. Third, sections rather than entire recordings are likely to be reviewed. This has been evidenced in the Cultura viewership data. So anything we can do to improve student navigation through the content should be seen as an improvement. And fourth, um, just to clarify um, an issue that has come up in the past, and that is attendance is actually a course policy issue. It is not in any way connected to whether the recordings are provided of the session. Um, so you should not, uh, not do supplemental recordings if you're hoping to in, uh, encourage attendance. They're unrelated issues, course policies, how you handle attendance. I saw no change in the pattern of attendance after providing supplemental recordings for three semesters. I did find, however, several students were very grateful that it was available whenever they had absences. So let's continue this on the next slide with a few other items. Uh, fifth, ESL students seem to benefit um, as well as students that the topics were new to them and wanted to uh, review further. And that's the sixth point is that we should do anything as faculty to encourage and facilitate that further review of our course content. That should only be seen as a positive. And seventh, when considering recording, we should also consider transcripts and or captioning as these, benefit, these uh, clearly benefit all students. So I wanted to thank you. I went through this very quickly. We're all very intimately familiar with uh, Zoom uh, for the transmission of class content. And we're gonna be doing this again in the fall. But I just wanted to say, consider clicking that record button on the Zoom screen. And if you set up a separate Zoom meeting for each course, it's real easy to, to have those sessions become available for each class. And it's, it's only good things can come from that in my opinion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. And I put um, back into the chat window uh, a, a link to the new instructional video that is, it wasn't part of your project, but it certainly is tangentially related. Uh, Bart mentioned this new video produced by the IT Learning and Development Group at the, the top of the symposium. So for folks who are, um, or you've got their, their mind thinking about recording video and, and recording content and so forth. I wanted to just uh, put that back into the chat. Uh, so there's that. Uh, are there any questions for Ed on his project? Please feel free if there are to go ahead and put those into the Q&A window. Well, while you're thinking about um, whether you have any questions for Ed or for anyone else, uh, I want to just take the opportunity to, to thank today's panelists for sharing their TLT faculty fellowship projects with us. What an incredibly diverse set of projects around learning spaces. And, and I think Priya's project has us all thinking a little bit more about learning places. So I'd like to also acknowledge the tremendous contributions of our TLT project leads as well, Lori Weaver, Amy Kuntz, who drove our slideshow today, Zach Zidick, and Hannah Williams. And it's my pleasure to share with you next year's cohort of fellows. You can see their images on the screen right now. When we hold the symposium in March, we don't have an opportunity to tell you who's up next. But here we are late in July, and so we know who comprises next uh, year's cohort of fellows. And we're really excited to, to welcome Margaret Hoffman, Tom Hogan, Justin Brown, Adrian Berrigan, and Jaime Prudencio, those three uh, gentlemen will be part of a fellows project team. Don Pfeiffer writes, Randy McIntyre, and Jan Ryman. So uh, we're super excited to work with them and, and have them be our 2020-21 uh, 
uh, cohort for next year. So their fellowships, most of which are slated to begin later this summer, will represent a diverse set of projects focused on student engagement. And we look forward to hearing from them in this very spot next year. So uh, on behalf of the TLT Summer Series planning team, I'd like to thank all of our symposium presenters and audience members for continuously striving to improve the learning experience for our Penn State students and sharing your innovative ideas with the teaching and learning community at Penn State. We hope you'll join us for the final Canvas Day session at one o'clock Eastern time this afternoon. And we look forward to seeing you all at next year's event. Thanks for joining us this morning. Have a great day.